to roll this beautiful bean footage. Do you know that reference at all, Justin? <laughs> bushes bean, bushes beans, bush bean, bush bean. Yeah. Let's roll this beautiful bean footage. <laughs> Scott knew that reference. Anybody else out there know that reference? Let's roll that beautiful bean footage. With a golden retriever. Surely. All right, we're live, so we're going to encourage y'all to stand and sing with us this morning. <coughs> Welcome everybody on Facebook as they are starting to join us. of my heart you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh cause you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah a cloud by day is a sign that you are with me the fire by night is the guiding light to my feet as you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh yahweh because you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah You stepped into my Egypt And you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom Into the promised land And now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love Cause you stepped into my Egypt and you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom Into the promised land And now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love Cause you're the God who fights for me Lord of every Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. You guys can have a seat. And we are so glad that you have joined us here. We're so glad that you've joined us online. If you are um, online and you're watching, I encourage you to share the link while we're um, broadcasting today. And uh, there might be some other folks out there in Facebook land that are online this morning that need to hear some good news from Pastor Dan. So um, that's a great way to share, to share the word, is to just post it on Facebook. Um, if you'll give me just a little bit of your attention this morning, I've got a few announcements. Um, First of all, for those of you here, if you're on Facebook, let us know you're here. But if you want to sign the notebook, we certainly encourage you to do that as well. Um, Wednesday night, uh, um, starting on Wednesday uh, this week, Pastor Dale is going to be doing a um, Bible study in room 804 from 6 to 7 at the main campus. Tonight, 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 mark your calendars, Pastor Dan is going to be doing his presentation on his archaeological dig um, in the Holy Land. So that starts at 6 p.m. here in this space. So, uh, And then we're also going to broadcast it on Facebook live. So if you are in Timbuktu today and you want to watch that, we certainly encourage you to join online. We'll post that just like we do normal service. Um, you what? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cottage cheese. Yeah. I don't know. That might be a little weird. But um, <laughs> uh, just wanted to remind you, if you can, if you'll come a little bit early to bring that. Um, and then uh, the other thing I want to encourage is just being a host. Uh, you guys have a comfort with this place, and we want to make sure that those who come in feel welcome. Uh, so if you'll make an effort tonight to just greet and welcome people, too. Um, so thank you. Absolutely. And uh, Barbara, Pastor Barbara, is going to start um, a Bible study on an Israel study starting September 25th. So that's um, a week from this Monday. Uh, and it's going to be here at this campus, and it's going to be at 6 o'clock. So um, lots of great things going on. There's two Bible studies um, that are starting up. And um, then there's um, we've got some folks that we need to... Uh, specifically reach out for this morning um, Cade Buchanan and his little family um, Aileen Lambert Blake Eads Wesley Kidd of course all the folks in uh, Kentucky and around Buchanan County and such that are still dealing with flood victims and, and I'm going to add um, Katie and Eli to that list uh, if we could just remember those two kids yes Teresa Teresa's brother Drew that's in Ukraine. Anybody else got anything specific that they got going on this morning? Um, I know it's all, that's what we come for is to have, um, just to remember folks. Lorraine McHale. Lorraine McHale, and um, for those of you in Bristol um, that know Donnie Bradley and Michael and Ryan Bradley, um, Donnie went to school with Greg. He had a stroke this week and was on a vent, and Coop knows his, um, knows his sons, and it was not looking good for him. They, you know, we've got young boys that are 20 and probably 22 making decisions about life for their dad, so that's, that's tough on those boys. So we need to lift Brian, Ryan, Michael, 
and Donnie and that family as well this morning. So uh, thank you for that. And if you guys have any public prayer requests that you want to put on Facebook, we always encourage that. And if you want to keep those private, um, reach out to Pastor Dan and um, so that he can have that. If you want to leave anything on our, on our cross over here, here in the space, we always encourage that. But more importantly, if you want to lift a praise up, we, we always want to go to the prayer requests. Um, but we're supposed to start in praise and thanksgiving. So um, that's just as important to leave those praises out there. If anything, it's more important. So, um, so let's, uh, let's stand and let's sing. And we're going to sing about the goodness of God this morning. And that's how we're going to start out our morning, praising the goodness of God. So won't you sing with us? I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God the simpleness of that that we will sing of his goodness God is good all the time and all the time God is good you guys can have a seat and we go into our prayer time this morning and um if you want anything, uh, if you want to have special prayer this morning, if you feel like you need something laid down specifically, 
Dan's here. He'll gladly pray with you. Never feel like you can't come forward. If you got, if you have that tug on your heart and you're afraid that somebody's going to look at you wrong or somebody's going to think, what are they going up there for? That's not what this place is for. If you feel that tug on your heart, listen to it. Because that's an that's a opportunity. Because God's talking to you. And he's trying to get closer to you. And we talk about how he pursues us. He does. He pursues each and every one of us. There's a song we sing. It's called um, The Reckless Love of God. And it is reckless because he does go after the one. And maybe this morning, you're the one. Are you the one this morning online or in here? That he's reaching out to you because he is so good. But we're going to encourage you to sing with us this morning of how great he is as well. Praise, we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our 
this morning. Lord, you are truly, truly great. And we just can't express how much we appreciate your goodness and how much you love us. Lord, we could never, ever, ever express that enough. But know in the smallest of ways that we attempt. Lord, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for being with those that are away from us today. And Lord, we just want to lift up some folks that we've already called out. And you know the what lays on our heart this morning. But Lord, we know that you are already there. We know that you're already showing up in a mighty, mighty way. And we lift that up as praise to you this morning. And Lord, sometimes those prayers come in the different ways of what we expect or what we think we want. But we know that you are always good. And no matter what the situation, that you are always there. In the mountains and on the valleys, you are always there, Lord. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for Dan and we thank you for the, the word that you've laid on his heart that we're going to hear today. And Lord, we pray that um, that word is directed for each and every one of us. They're the same words, but they may have a different meaning for everyone that hears it today. And Lord, we are so grateful, so grateful that you come into this space and that you want to be with us, that you have chosen each and every one of us to be yours. So Lord, be with us this morning. Guide us as we listen. Help us to stay focused on just this short time in your presence. Help us to hear your word today. And help us to use it and fuel us through the week to come. That we can be your hands and feet in every situation. That when the opportunity presents itself, that we will give a kind word. And that will be the light of Jesus in this world. For Lord, we know how bright it shines. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you, thank you, thank you for a Savior in Jesus. And it's in his mighty name that we ask all these things. Amen. Thank you, Ben, for leading us. It's good to be gathered in worship with you, and I'm always grateful that we got such a great praise band, um, so thank you, God. Um, and it's good uh, for you to be with us online, too. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dan. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, I'm one of the pastors here at Pleasant View, and uh, just really, I'm glad, I'm always glad for Sunday morning to roll around, because we get together as God's people and enter into um, singing songs of praise for him. Um, but also to lean into his word a little bit more and to trust in his promises a little bit more. So uh, We're going to open up um, Timothy, which is in the New Testament. So if you've got your Bible and you want to turn to Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be reading from that. You'll see it on the screen, of course. And um, this is a letter from, uh, uh, scholars debate, but I think we're safe in saying it's from the Apostle Paul. Um, you know, if you have other theories about who it's from, I'm glad to have those conversations with you. But it's uh, offered uh, in the scriptures as a letter from Paul to Timothy. And Timothy was one of the contemporaries of Paul who traveled with him on the missionary journeys. And uh, we believe this is written to Timothy in Ephesus. And Paul is in a different location writing back to Timothy. Some words of encouragement because Timothy's leading the church. He's like the pastor of the church. He's the church leader. So it's a personal letter from Paul uh, to Timothy. But um, don't let that uh, tune you out, uh, because I think it's got a personal word for us to hear from God today. So I want to invite you to hear God's word beginning in verse 1. Now, just a, Paul is talking about prayer here when he starts out talking. Um, but I really want you to lean into when he shifts that into talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, because that's what we're going to focus on today. First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in the high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human who gave himself as a ransom for all. This was attested to at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So if you ever uh, redeemed anything, like a gift card, I've redeemed gift cards. I love getting gift cards. Not that I'm asking you all to give me gift cards. <laughs> you never know what you say and people respond. But I'm not asking for gift cards for me. But if you want to give gift cards to those who are in need, I'm all about that. That's cool. Uh, or if you give gift cards to me and say, take these to people in need, I can do that too. <laughs> but I'm not asking for me. But it's fun to redeem a gift card, right? You get on Amazon or whatever, or you go to Walmart or, you know, wherever the gift card's for, you show up at the restaurant and you're like, I get to eat for free, right? <laughs> so it's a cool experience, you know. And you're trading uh, that card in exchange for something else, right? The value of the meal, the value of the stuff you bought on Amazon that you really didn't need but you had to have, right? The value. It's easier to do that when it's free, too, right? <laughs> so um, we redeem things, right? In our society. And, and I want to focus on this word redemption because we redeem all kinds of things. So there are, other, there are various ways the word redeem is used in our English language. Sometimes it's just that exchange of the gift card, and you give that card for a monetary value. But usually it has this notion of an exchange. You know, and sometimes we see uh, that word used in other ways, too. So um, I don't know if you've ever taken out a loan. Like, I've had a lot of student loans over my lifetime. Um, and with that, you get a note, you know, where you owe on the loan. And once you pay that off, you've redeemed the note. So you're giving your cash back for the cash they gave you, and you get essentially the note given to you is the idea. And you redeem the note. And you might do that with a home mortgage. If you own a home, you know, you redeem the mortgage. Uh, there are uh, different ways that we use that term. But the idea always has some kind of exchange, right? That re redemption involves some kind of exchange. And today we're looking at redemption in the biblical context. And it's going to take on a particular meaning. It's not the general, hey, here's a gift card from God. Although, in a way, it might be. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's a little bit cooler than buying something on Amazon, and we're going to explore what this idea of redemption means. Um, now, this is in the context of the, the sermon series we've been doing, The Big Picture. And so we started out the first Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago, with the idea that God created the world, and that's our starting point, right? And because God created, it's what? It's good, and it's very good, he even says, Right? And he caps off that whole creation effort uh, with the culmination of humanity. You being made in God's image and likeness. Awesome. Right. And we were rocking in Eden, hanging out with God. It was good. Walking in the garden, talking. Uh, good days. Uh, but then we got a little uppity, right? Adam and Eve decided to take things into their own hands. They knew better. And through their choices to choose other than God to be their own gods, right, that knowledge that they were seeking. Uh, sin and death enter the world. Evil enters the world. Uh, so we talked about that last week, that idea. And so we've got creation in the story of humanity and God. We've got fall, the fall, as we call it, the doctrine of the fall. And today we're looking at redemption. So we're in this mess. We're in this predicament. predicament. You know, we talked last week about how uh, the introduction of sin into the world um, has consequences for us in the way we live today. Uh, and there are two, two ways we talked about that last week. We talked about um, kind of being stained by uh, the sin of Adam and Eve, that that's the mark on humanity, right? And so we call that original sin. You're born into sin. That's the condition of humanity. So it's not like there's good people born in the world and, and Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler and all the baddies are over here. You know, they're too created in the image and likeness of God. So we don't have good and bad people. We have people who are all stained by sin, right? So the other way that we sin, so born into original sin, that's our condition, our inclination. You might recall Martin Luther's idea that we're bent in on ourselves, that we're self-centered. Um, and I also offered you Soren Kierkegaard's understanding that 
Sin is when we make um, even the good things in our life our gods over the one true God, right? So it's not just being born into that condition, and we, we point to Adam and Eve and we say it's their fault. There's also, the, in addition to original sin, actual sin, sins that we choose. So the temptation's there, and then we choose to do the thing that offends God, right? So that's our condition, original sin, actual sin. Man, what are we going to do about that? And so today we're talking about redemption, the fix. This is God's work in the fix. Uh, and so this is, this is great. This is good stuff. This is exciting. Uh, God fixes things in the redemption. And so today we're going to talk about five things uh, that we kind of have in this um, doctrine of God and doctrine of redemption. Now, I know this is all doctrinally stuff and thinking about God and all this stuff, but here's the reason it matters. Because the ways we think about God and the ways that we understand the world, the worldview that we carry, and we all carry one, and sometimes we don't quite know what it is, and sometimes it's a mutt from a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of capitalism and a little bit of democracy and whatever else we throw in there, right? But Christianity has a very particular worldview that invites us to understand the world, how God is at work in the world and what our role is in that. And so that's kind of the doctrinal stuff, the beliefs, the theology about God. But what we do with that, whether we know it or not, is our beliefs and our understanding about God operating in the world then tells us how we live. Sometimes it's how we live that really shows us what our beliefs are. So I think what this series hopefully is inviting you to do is think about the big picture, your worldview, and have you thought... Um, about the world and the way God's operating in the world and what your role is in terms of these ideas of creation, fall, redemption, and we'll, we'll talk about restoration. Now we're going to break that into two Sundays, uh, so that's coming. What is God continuing to do and what's the end game, um, you know, where we end up? So today, redemption. Um, we're going to look at and this tags into uh, the consequence of sin, so I touched on it last week. But um, we're going to look at uh, why do we need to be redeemed, right? So that's the first thing we'll look at today. Uh, we'll also explore the idea that we can't redeem ourselves and figure that out. Why can't we redeem ourselves? Why can't I just be a little extra good and make it up to God? So we can't redeem ourselves. So that means that we need a redeemer. We need someone else to save us because we can't do it ourselves, and Jesus is our redeemer. That's what the scriptures tell us. That's the foundational belief of Christianity, that Jesus is the one who redeems us. And that the effect of that, then, is to put us back into right relationship with God. It's the fix, and Jesus is the fix to our problems. Jesus is the answer, not the Sunday school answer, but the true answer to the world's problems. Because we're all operating under this condition. And that's the last point, that the redemption is not just for me and my personal salvation, but it's for the whole of creation. So every other person you see, every space of the earth that you encounter, Jesus Christ came not just to personally save me, which is crazily, um, you know, almost an afterthought for us sometimes in the church. I mean, that's just a phenomenal thought if you just spent the day, like, meditating on that. Uh, that's pretty amazing that the God who spoke and created wants to um, redeem you personally, uh, which is really, really cool. It just tells you how much God loves you. But um, that last point then, that God's redemption is for the whole of creation. And then that invites us to some next steps, to examine our own lives and try to figure out, well, am I trying to be my own redeemer? Am I trying to save myself? And I think we're all probably in that role a little bit every now and then. We think we can do it on our own. We think we can figure things out on our own. Um, but the step, the invitation would be then, whether you're a believer or someone who's new to the journey, kind of curious about this God thing, is to just trust and surrender that Jesus is the Redeemer he promises to be. And that you don't have to save yourself because, number one, you can't. But that that's the sign of God's love the depth of God's love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's good stuff. But it doesn't stop there. So that's number one, trust is the invitation. But number two is, as we heard the Apostle Paul talking about, then go and share this good news. 
because it's pretty incredible news. And that's not something you should keep to yourselves. There's people to tell, says Jesus. So number one, we need a redeemer because of the consequence of sin. Eden is lost. We now stand outside of Eden. If you remember the scriptures from Genesis, uh, God has placed an angel with a flaming sword, kind of cutting off uh, paradise. Paradise is gone. And now man and woman live by the sweat of the brow among thistles and thorns in a broken earth, right? There's good news, though. Hang in there. Now, why is Eden lost? Well, that's paradise. That's the place where God walks and talks with humanity. And in the presence of sin, God can't be. So if we have infected Eden with sin, God, who is not only buddy Jesus, but holy other, cannot continue to be present in that because God is holy other and we are not, right? So the consequence of sin is that separation, that, that we have this um, division between us, this chasm between us and the holiness of God. Now, God has called us to be righteous, and that means holy, to be like God. We're made in God's image and likeness, but sin has entered in, and we are under that human condition. And so we are not able to do that. The relationship with God has suffered. It's broken. There's something not quite right with it, right? And what this does is it creates um, kind of a debt that we owe to God. You know, God's called us to be holy. God's given us the gift of life. God's invited us into this life with God, and we've said, you know, I think I can do it on my own. And so we reject what God has offered, and we fall under the weight of sin, and then we go, oh, wait a second. God is holy other, and I realize that now, and now I'm indebted to God for the offense I have caused, right? You know, if you're in a um, car accident, you know, I hope that won't ever happen to any of you, uh, Sure, it's happened to some of you already, but uh, you know, if you're in it and you cause it, you have a debt that you owe, basically, an obligation that you owe to the other person to put it back right. Your offense has created some kind of obligation to them. And in a similar way, when we offend God, we have some kind of a debt we owe to God, some kind of obligation we owe to God to put it back right, to fix that broken relationship. And what we find is we can't do it ourselves. There's two reasons why we can't do it ourselves. First is that we, well, I think, I think we do this naturally. Like, I think we think sometimes if I, if I sin a lot, oops, I need to get on the right track and live in a little extra uh, goodness in my life to make it up to God, right? Right? So maybe I'll go down to the um, uh, food bank and work a little bit extra hard this week because I was you know, kind of offensive to God last week. We're going to make it up. We're going to do a little extra good and, and fix things and be in right relationship. And the idea there is that we're doing something extra good to earn God's favor. But anything that we do that would be called good is something we're already supposed to be doing, right? God said, I've created you in my image and likeness. I've created you for good. That's your design. That's who you're meant to be. That's what you're supposed to already be doing. So any good... You should already be doing. There's not like you could do extra good. You know, it's like if I said to one of my kids, hey, you know, your chore, I'm going to pay you, and your chore is to take out the trash every Friday. That's just, that's the expectation. That's what we've set up. And I'm going to give you an allowance, and here it is in advance even, because I trust you, right? And he or she doesn't take it out on Friday, and they get it out on Saturday, though, and they come running to me, and they say, hey, I took out the trash, you know? I did it on a day I wasn't supposed to do it, but um, don't I deserve some kind of reward? Maybe some ice cream in addition to the allowance you're still going to pay me? But the expectation, the obligation is already there to take out the trash. And likewise, any good that we can muster up that is offered to God as good is something that we already are expected to do. 
to live lives good and holy and righteous that reflect our good and holy and righteous creator. Right? And here's the second problem with um, trying to fix it ourselves. That even if we did have the ability to muster up some extra goodness, which I'm saying we don't, but let's assume that you're going to just really figure that out somehow, and you're going to extra, extra good, extra good, extra good for you know a whole month straight. <laughs> Listen to what the scriptures say. We have all become, this is Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah is written, um, depending on the scholars' debate, who, who you want to believe in the commentaries, uh, somewhere between 500 to 700 years before Jesus. Uh, but there is a historical prophet named Isaiah who lived in the 8th century B.C. So rest assured on that, there was a prophet Isaiah. And so regardless of when this is recorded, here's what he said. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds, all of our good that we do, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth, filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf in our iniquities, like a wind that takes us away. Did you hear what Isaiah is telling us? The, the voice of God, the prophet of God is telling us that as good as we think are the things that we do are, they're really filthy rags compared to the holiness of God. And I don't want that to discourage you from doing good and pursuing God's goodness in your life and the lives of others. But it gives us some perspective, right? Like usually what we're doing when we're doing good is we're comparing my good deeds against your good deeds. Oh, well, I showed up at the food bank twice. And then you come back and you say, ha, I did it four times. And look at my goodness, right? And Isaiah is reminding us that when we're talking about our own goodness, we have to think it's not about me versus you, but we look at it in the context of relating to God, who is pure and holy other, who defines what goodness is. Right? And each sin, then, that we do creates a deeper debt that we can't pay. And we need a Savior. We need somebody to step in and redeem us, to get back what we've lost. Right? God does what we can't do ourselves. God comes in the form of Jesus. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation, that God takes flesh to become our Savior and our Redeemer. He's the fix for the problem that we have. As the scripture said from Timothy that we read, he's the ransom. He's the exchange for the bad that we've done. Listen to 1 Timothy again. Um, I'm going to read verses 3 to 6. This is right and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The second person of the Trinity, God, comes in the flesh to give himself as a ransom for all. For all the sins of the world. Pretty mind-boggling to think when I just think about my list of sins. <laughs> you know? And you're thinking, wow, the sins of the world. Every person who's walked the planet. God's love has come in the form of Jesus to redeem that. So, what we affirm then in the doctrine of the atonement, there's your fancy theological word for the day, atonement. And if, if you want to break that down, at one meant atonement, um, what the doctrine of the atonement is saying is that Jesus is coming to make us one with God again to restore that broken relationship. So Jesus didn't come just to die according to the evil systems that we have, the injustices that we perpetuate in the world. 
He didn't die just as an example of goodness, suffering under evil. But he died to redeem, to be a ransom for us, the exchange for us. He died to pay the debt that we owed. So that's the effect then of redemption, that God buys us back, makes things right, puts us back into right relationship, pays off the promissory note. Pays off the debt. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that experience of paying off a loan. I know when I paid off school loans, <laughs> I was like, let's go eat cake. <laughs> you know, it's time to celebrate. That's good stuff. There's something there that you feel free. And that's the very idea is that God is a savior who liberates you from the bondage, the captivity, the debt owed of sin. And we call this doctrine, here's another fancy word, the doctrine of justification. You are made right, you are justified by what God in Christ has done for you. Now, we often do this at Christmas because Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation when God becomes flesh and dwells among us. And we love baby Jesus in his golden fleece diaper, right? But my wife's back there shaking her head, like, really? <laughs> I love it. I love baby Jesus in his golden fleece diaper. But listen to what the prophet Isaiah tells us about the Messiah, the Christ, who is coming. Again, this is Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus comes. The, the passage I'm going to read from, we often read at Christmas, celebrating the Incarnation. And this is called um, Suffering Servant Passages of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, peace with God, was on him and by his wounds we are healed by his wounds we are healed that's the effect of the redemption of jesus it's also um, stated in the new testament second corinthians 5 for our sake god made christ to be sin who knew no sin jesus knew no sin in his human life he's the only human who's ever lived a sinless life as good as you think you are sorry <laughs> I'm sure it was close, though, right? But Jesus chose to become sin so that we might be redeemed, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, suffering for our transgressions, healing our wounds by his stripes. In uh, the book Cross of the Christ, uh, there's, have you all heard of John Stott? He's an Anglican priest. Um, kind of contemporary preacher. Um, but anyway, he, he wrote this book called The Cross of Christ, and this is what he says about the heart of the Christian message. The essence of sin is that we human beings, substituting ourselves for God, uh, let me try that again. The essence of sin is we human beings, substituting ourselves for God, right? Think back to Kierkegaard's definition, you know, putting our identity uh, on something other than God. So we're substituting ourselves for God, while the essence of the salvation of God is God substituting himself for us. There's an exchange, a substitution that's happening here. He continues, we put ourselves where only God deserves to be. That's our sin. God puts himself where we deserve. It's the exchange. Jesus is the great exchange. All other religions and all other worldviews are not going to offer this to you. This is one of the hallmarks of Christianity. They're going to tell you, you need to pray this way, you need to meditate this way, you need to do these charity acts, and then you can find the external God or you can find the internal peace if God doesn't exist in that system. But it's things that you do to accomplish salvation. Things that you do to accomplish redemption. 
And they're trying to show you a way of salvation. And Jesus isn't offering you a way, but here's the thing. He is the way. It is through him and his grace and his love that we don't have to merit. We don't have to knock our heads up against brick walls trying to do some extra good to earn God's favor. It's grace poured out. Pure grace. And now, let me throw this in here too because I always, I always chuckle when I hear this. You know, you'll hear critics, sometimes atheists, agnostics, you know, secular humanists who will say, well, you know, the fact that God killed Jesus is a form of divine child abuse. <laughs> I've heard this, yeah. Um, you know, God, God could have saved the world anyway, and God chose to punish his only begotten son. And it sounds like divine child abuse to them. But I want you to think about forgiveness for a second, because this is the same experience that you have when you offer forgiveness to someone. Forgiveness is bearing the cost of the harm rather than making the wrongdoer do it, right? Think about the times in your life where you've been involved in forgiving someone else. And in that act of forgiveness, you absorb the harm. You don't demand that there be justice, right? So it's a choice of grace to offer forgiveness. Forgiveness is absorbing the debt of sin. That's God's work on the cross. That's why God chose the cross. And the mistake that the critics make is they they try to separate God the Father and God the Son eternally, but they can't be separated because, as the Scriptures in Timothy reminds us, there is one God. And he's known to us in many ways, but he's known to us as Jesus. So when Jesus hangs on the cross for our salvation and for our redemption, offering us forgiveness, he's absorbing all of that evil and pain and hurt and offense into himself. Could God have saved the world in any other way? Perhaps, I don't know. But he chose this way to redeem us. Did God have to do that? No. Did God have to make a way for you and me to be restored into relationship with him? Absolutely not. But he chose to absorb the evil that we do. Not just in his body, but in the fullness of who he was on the cross. That's good news. And that should change our understanding of how the world operates, our worldview. But here's the thing, it's not just about you. For keep in mind, this is for the whole of creation. First Timothy tells us that Jesus came as a ransom for all. And we hear the Apostle Paul at the end of that section that we read talking about, and I am a herald, I am a messenger of that. That's my job in life. That's what I do. That's what I've been called to. And likewise, we have that same calling on us. Because, friends, this is incredible news. That God's love is so deep and so strong that he would bear the debt and absorb it so that we might be brought back good news that needs to be shared. Christ offered himself as an exchange for every human that has ever walked the planet. It has to be received. But that's the depth of God's love that he offers. And it's not just the people of the world. And I think this is where we get hung up because we get so excited about, yay, Jesus is my personal Savior. And yes, he is. But he's also the personal Savior of everybody you don't like that cut in front of you on the way here or that's going to jump you in line at the restaurant or that's going to give you poor service at the table. But tip your waiter good anyway is a sign of God's love, right? Every person. And, and so does that change the way you interact with people? If you start to look at them and you say, Christ died not just for me, but Christ died for you, and I might not particularly like you right now, 
but I'm going to remind myself that you two are made in God's image and likeness good, and you two are a sinner, which I see very well right now. And Christ came to redeem you. And that has to be my message to you, even in my disdain for you, even in my disgust of you. Let me look deeper and see the world as God sees it. The worldview of redemption. The redemption of not just the people, but the whole of creation. And that changes our relationship with the earth, too. It invites us to a deeper love and respect and care for the earth if we know that Christ took the cross to absorb the evil that we have caused, the, the recklessness and the havoc that we have unleashed on the earth. Christ took the cross for that, to redeem it. And we'll talk more about what restoration looks like um, in the coming Sundays. So what? Nice doctrines. You learned a new word today, or maybe you knew the word, atonement. I don't know how many of you throw out the word justification, but you can try that at the next party you're at. Hey, let's talk about justification. <laughs> Tell me how that goes, too. That'll be great. <laughs> great. Well, good belief forms good living. So a good worldview is going to help you live in a way that honors God and helps restore his image and likeness in others, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in you and work. That's the so what. So it invites you today to trust Jesus as the one who redeems. And honestly, that's fairly liberating if you think about it. There's a freedom in knowing that God is the one who saves, and you don't have to do it yourself. It takes a lot of pressure off of you. But there's also an expectation that you go from that point forward, repenting of sin and moving toward a life that honors God, reaching for that holiness that he offers, that righteousness. That's our invitation for all of us. You were created good. You are created good. You're created to live in God's design, to be in his image and likeness, and to live at peace and enjoy with one another and all that you meet. That's what we're talking about in this worldview. May we be a people who call on our Redeemer, our Savior Jesus, to help lift us up and lift others. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to invite the band to come up as we uh, enter into our, our closing song of worship. Um, you know, when we talk about Jesus, our, our Redeemer, you know, I think we all have thoughts about that. You know, and sometimes we don't name them or articulate them, but, you know, it really does call forth a response you know and I'm not saying you have to like come up here and do anything special or kneel down or anything like that but I, I think you know at least in the moments of singing um, and maybe in the moments of the day as you move from this place I think it does invite you just to this deeper commitment to Jesus and you say God I don't, I don't have this all figured out but I, I'm just going to trust you and I'm going to take a sigh of relief that I don't have to be extra good to earn your love but your love comes first and offers me redemption. And I just, I want to open myself to that. Because if you're like me, you're going to find that your life is full of mixed motives. I mean, how many of us purely act out of love and adoration of God? I would love to tell you I do, but if I sit here and told you I did, I'm just trying to look, make myself look better. That's my motivation, right? So we all are challenged with and the redemption of God invites you to just say, I need more of that, and I'm going to trust you to work your way in me, Holy Spirit. So come. So let that be your song of praise, that there's a God who loves you that much, crazy in love with you, in ways I can't even explain to you. Crazy, crazy, crazy in love with you. Oh, did y'all see that? Uh, I'm still preaching. I'm going to shut up. No, you're uh, good. You <laughs> did y'all see uh, in the news this week the new James, uh, what's the name of the new telescope? James Webb telescope it's it's like the next generation beyond the hubble telescope y'all heard of the hubble telescope that opened up the skies in new ways 
And this thing, they showed some images on the news, and it's crazy, like galaxies that we couldn't see, that it was just blackness in the sky. And now we're seeing hundreds of galaxies that we've never seen before. And I go, wow, this God is crazy in terms of like what he's done in creation. And the word of redemption is that he loves you so much. In spite of that power to speak universes into being, he loves you so much that he took on the form of Jesus to come and save. That's how much you're loved. And that's what redemption offers you, is restoration to that God. So the invitation to, to just trust God a little more. And I'll be over here if I can pray with you, if, if we can um, you know, talk about any of the things that are on your heart. I'm glad to do that. But you don't have to do that to um, move deeper into trusting the Spirit. So we're going to invite you to stand and sing. worn and weary land where many a dream has died like a tree planted by the water we never will run dry so living water flowing through God we thirst for more of you fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high shine like the sun make darkness run in we know we were made for so much more than We were made to thrive Into your word we're digging deep To know our Father's heart Into the world we're reaching out To show them who you are So living water flowing through God we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire Just to know
to thrive. body uh, that is gathered to honor and praise. And so I want to encourage you to keep honoring and praising God to, to thrive in God's goodness and grace as you go from this place, uh, to love and serve and, and share that good news that there's a redeemer, um, that there's one who can fix our alienation, uh, and that one is Jesus. Go and make him known in the things you say and in the things you do. Go to love and serve. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace.